Brett, I am so freaking excited. You are on the Magnificent Mamas Thrive Show. I, you and I have been friends for so many years and then we ebbed and flowed and we went into out of each other's life. But I saw on Facebook, you are launching the coolest looking book I have ever seen. I'm like, I gotta read this book. I don't know what it's about, but when I started scoping into like what you're doing, your story hit me in the heart because you know we know each other and your story and my story align. So without further ado, please share with us who you are, what you're up to, and what you're about to launch to real life people. Well, my name is Brett Russo. We've known each other for a long time. Um, I went through um, IVF and infertility um, in order to get my children. And it was an extremely dark time for me. And I was very inspired to just document my story at first for myself. And then as I got deeper in, I realized that there are women out there that need to hear this. And uh, then I just started writing this book and in the hopes that it could help other women out there and launches next week. And I'm very excited. Um, wait, wait yeah. put it back up. The underwear, tell me the name again. So it's called The Underwear in My Shoe. So and cool. yeah, um, and I don't want to do a spoil alert, but you know, we've all been at the doctor's office and gynecologist and you take your underwear off and you throw it in your shoe. And I felt like I was just staring at it in my shoe for two years. And <laughs> that's what inspired me to <laughs> make that the title. And we can laugh about it now. However, yeah. the real truth is going to that doctor's office every month or multiple times monthly is so isolating, lonely, painful. And then you see all these other beautiful mamas that are growing their bellies and there's a baby in there and maybe they didn't even really want it. Maybe they asked for it for years. Their stories are all different. But what we, do, what we know is our story is that we don't have. So okay. you're a, ki you're a kick-ass kind of gal. I have known you a long time. You run a business. You've been that kind of a gal who just makes it happen. So tell me from the mindset of a gal who's like that, what, where were you? What was going on in your mind? Well, you know, I started, you know, I met my husband when I was 35 years old. So we got married when I was 36 and we actually took a year off because I thought I would never have an issue having a baby. I mean, I was healthy. I was an athlete. Always my menstrual cycles were on the dot. I mean, I barely, you know, never smoked, not a big drinker. I mean, I, I never thought in a million years. And to be honest with you, I almost looked down at people that were obsessed with having kids and obsessed with it. It was like, just relax, you know, everything will be fine. And um, so we started trying and I was completely upended when I realized that we were having issues. You know, we tried for about a year on our own. And at first, you know, of course, like everyone going through it, it's fun. You're excited each month to see when, when's the month. And then as you get deeper, you're like, oh, wow, oh, wow. And um, it gets pretty devastating pretty quickly. Um, and you don't think that you're going to be an IVF patient. I mean, so many people I've talked to, unless you have a pre-existing condition of some sort, you never think you're going to go the distance. You're saying, oh, that won't be me. That won't be me. And the further and further you get, the more heartbreaking it is. And the more you clam up, the more you feel isolated and like a failure. And, um, you know, our story, you know, we had, um, about five rounds of IVF and it just, you know, I found myself in the middle. I'm like, wait, IVF's not even working for me? Like what's going on here? And it was hard because a lot of people um, don't realize how painful it is. You know, it's not cancer. It's not something that's gonna kill you um, physically, but it's completely devastating. And it's not something that you're ready or prepared to deal with. It's not something that you know how to cope with. I mean, no one teaches you how to cope with infertility. No one teaches you how to deal with the feelings that you're feeling. And at least for me, I had never felt feelings that devastating. I just was completely shocked and I didn't know who to go to. And a lot of times people say, oh, don't worry, it'll be fine. Or don't right. worry, it's you know, happen. it's not 
Yeah. Yeah. Stop uh, stressing about it. Once you relax, go for a massage. It'll happen. Oh, totally. <laughs> As if they'd be reacting any differently if right. they were, you know. Um, so, you know, and it's hard. I mean, I have a twin brother who um, they got pregnant immediately. And that was tough. That was in the heart of my journey. And I know it weighed on them. And, you know, you just feel that everyone around you is pregnant and it's, it's difficult. But, you know, what I wanted to talk about in the book is that that's okay. And it's okay to feel these feelings. And, you know, especially when you don't feel like yourself or that you'll ever be yourself again, you, you will be, and it's okay, you know? And, and I love that you even bring that up, that it's okay to be in pain and it's okay to grieve. And I think that that's something that we don't discuss or talk about. And I know for me, my story was I did um, insemination every month. And so I was driving to the doctor's office or actually my midwife with my husband's sperm in between my breasts in the middle of winter because it had to stay warm. <laughs> And you feel absolutely ridiculous and so um, desperate. You'll do whatever it takes. And then to the nothing happened at stage of it, like, oh my goodness, you get your period. And you want to scream and you want to hurt somebody and you want somebody to blame. And I think that was the thing for me. I just wanted to blame somebody. I wanted somebody to be at the cause of the reason why I couldn't, because like you, I was healthy. My husband was healthy. There was no reason. I was 30 some, or, you know, 28 to 30 something. And there was no real reason and no one can identify it. So you just want to be okay with knowing that there's a loss. And, and the other thing, I don't know if you felt this way, but when you're younger and you're in a relationship, you're like, oh my God, God forbid I get pregnant. My parents would kill me, right? Right. <laughs> it's amazing, right? How <laughs> so then, then when you're in that space of loss after loss, it's a grieving and you have to honor yourself for the grievance. And, and I don't know how you are even where you are. Now you have two babies, but... I think the process of what you went through of by writing your story has allowed you to make it validating and it's real. But to the mom who, or the woman who doesn't get to realize it's okay to grieve and that it's a loss without a funeral, you know? That's what I want to say. I mean, I think a huge part, you know, my success was very at the very end of my journey. And I feel that you have to mourn the loss of having sometimes a family the way you always dreamed it to be. And that's okay. And I think that was a big process for me because I know that there are options. You know, you can have an egg donor, you can have a sperm donor, you can adopt there, you can have a surrogate, whatever your issue is. I mean, but there's, there's nothing that's going to take away from the fact that it's heartbreaking, though you have options and it's amazing. And there's so many conditions in life that there are not options. It's still a mourning process and you have to give yourself the time to mourn the, not just the loss of maybe a, a miscarriage or something like that, just the loss of an idea that what you wanted may have to change. And it doesn't mean, I think a big thing for me was if you want to be a mother, you will be a mother and don't be afraid to change your ending. And, um, that takes a lot of mental strategy and a lot of healing and a lot of strength, but you'll get there. And, um, I've learned through this process that being a mother is so much more than getting pregnant. I mean, it is so much more. It's the fight that these women are going through. It's the passion. It's, um, holding it together and, all of that just makes you such, you know, a big part of this process is it does change you. And I think it changes you in, a, in the best way possible. And it's amazing how in your darkest time, you can come out of this and say, you know what? I have a, a level of human awareness that I didn't have before of right. people hurting with whatever they're going through. Um, I have a perspective on being a mother um, that maybe when, you know, I'm not saying women that have babies naturally aren't amazing mothers, they are. But there's a perspective that you that changes you when you know how hard it is. And all of those things just 
make you stronger. And I got to a point somewhere in my journey where I actually felt blessed that I went through it because it really gave me so much strength that I didn't know I have courage. And I feel like this was my why to talk to people and say, it's okay to be grieving over this and let's talk about it. And you're not alone. And I feel very passionate about sharing my story, not because my story is so much worse than anyone else's. It's not. And I'm sure there's many women out there that have far worse than mine, but it's just, you're not alone. There's a sisterhood of women that know how you're feeling. And I also wanted to educate people that have family members going through it or friends. Like a lot of people, a lot of people have told me, I didn't know how hard this was. I had no idea what it was like because you know, it's a roller coaster. You don't go in there and get a baby. You know, people just think, oh, freeze your eggs, get them, and then you get a baby. I mean, there's a lot of ups and downs. And a lot, I always said, if you knew the ending, you could deal with the story. But Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But t- okay, I love that you just brought that up. Tell, tell me if you were to give advice to the family members that are dealing with somebody they love so much and they just wish that they could just place that baby in your belly or in your arms to give you whatever it is that you want, but they don't know the words, they don't know how to be, they don't know what to, they just don't know how to even be around you. So some of them just don't even come around or call. Mm -hmm. So what would you give that person? Where, what advice would you give that person? Because I think that's really important too. That's huge. I mean, I think, you know, the one thing I would say is, you know, if you don't hear from people, they don't know what to say. It doesn't mean they don't care to your point. It is a very difficult thing. Even going through it, it's difficult for me to find the words sometimes. Um, But I think for people that know someone going through it, I think just don't tell them how to feel. Don't tell them it's going to be okay. Don't tell them things that you don't know. Like I've learned, you know, even if it's someone that has a death of a wife or a father or something, something that I don't know about, I say, listen, I don't know what you're going through, but I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. And if you want to vent and, you know, you, I'm here for you and just show them that you're constantly there. And sometimes the process is long. It takes years and don't give up on them, you know, just still be there, send something funny, send something positive, but if they don't tell them not to stress, don't tell them what to do because they know what to do. They they're in it way more than you are. And to be told how to feel, you know, you want to, it, it's like, you don't want people to confirm what you're feeling is crazy. Like, cause right. they don't, they, they may be feeling the same way if they went through it. So. I and think, I think that that gives them the permission to not have to understand completely, but just to be there, not to give a solution but just to hold space or to hug you or to just listen, you know, don't say a thing, just listen. (laughs) Just let me rant. A big, big, big thing for me. And I don't know if you felt this way too. It was hard to open up to people because I didn't want to update them when there was nothing to update, like a test result didn't go well or something. So I would say, don't ask for results ever. Let them tell you, even if you know, oh, this was the day they were going to get a result. Just reach out and say, thinking of you, love you. You don't have to respond, but just want to know I'm thinking of you. Because the worst thing was to have to go down my list and tell five people, oh, that didn't work. And that's a nightmare, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's so hard because then it's like, you know, just reopening that same wound, but just to, just to know that my people are cheering me on. They love me and they want this for me. And it's a loss for everyone. And so that I want to bring up that, that topic, because I remember one day my husband's in the air flying to Boston and I, and I was at this perfect time where my, I needed a sperm (laughs) for very bluntly. I needed the damn sperm (laughs) and he's in the air. So then I had to go to the doctor and get an injection to slow down my egg because he was going to be coming home and blah, blah, blah. So like it just, again, like the pain on the pain on the pain. So I remember it was that time when we did the insemination and he said, Elizabeth, if this doesn't work, I think maybe we need to start talking about different adventures or avenues. And he said, because I, 
I, every time you go through this and you have a loss, I have pain for you and I have pain for me. And I also feel like, and I really want to hear your story because I know your husband is also going through loss and we don't really take it into consideration how much pain that the men are holding or the spouse or the partner is holding when it doesn't work. They're not just holding it for themselves, but they also have loss for you. Tell me how that looked in your beautiful life. <laughs> so, you know, it was a, you're like, I feel like you've like taking excerpts of the book because there's so much of what you're saying and just to the point where everyone goes through the same emotions. There's one part um, where we were going through it. I think we were through our third or fourth round and I had this moment of inspiration. I was in the shower and I was like, you know what? I know there are eggs in there. I'm not going to stop till I find it. I can do this. We had just had a failed round. I couldn't wait for him to get home. And he got home and I said, you know, babe, this is it. I know that they're in there and I'm just going to, we're going to keep doing this until it works. And he looks at me and he goes, well, we can't do this forever. And it kind of stopped me in my tracks because I said, I realized we may not have been on the same page. And, you know, we had a rough talk about it because he said, you know, because this is hard for me. And I'm like, I know it's hard. And he goes, no, it's hard for me to see you like this. Mm -hmm. and, you know, for, you know, these are guys that are supposed to be protecting us and wanting to be there for us. And there's nothing they can do at this point point and to see us in pain and to see us physically and emotional and you know you're hijacked I mean between yeah. the hormones and just <laughs> you know not to mention the hormones how crazy we become <laughs> I think one of my chapters in my book is called what kind of fucked up person invented Coleman <laughs> uh, but you know it's uh it's hard on them and you know it's hard because we're grieving. The way I always felt is like everyone's in fetal position trying to deal with their own feelings and you almost don't have, like I, I felt like I didn't even have time for his grief and that's not good. You know, you have to be there for each other and it's hard. It's definitely hard, but um, you know, the men kind of get thrown to the side because you think it's happening to women, but it's happening to the men too. And they take it differently. You know, they want to be able to fix the problem yep. and they can't. You know? Yeah. 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 And, and, and I think again, the pain, pain looks different in everybody's lives. Pain looks different for men versus women. Um, and we need to, especially as relationships or couples, partners, we need to understand that we are different and we are going to take the pain differently, but doesn't make it better or worse or less than, or more than pain is pain and we need to honor each other. And I think that's a part of what keeps people together, especially in times like this, because fertility could make or break a relationship, man. I mean, we were seven years into marriage when we went through it, but a young relationship like yours, that one, it's exhausting mentally, physically, financially, and you then come out completely different because of the hormones. You're changing your hormones. So even your outlook might look different. Your body's going to change too. Did you notice that? <laughs> oh yeah, everything. I mean, to the point where, you know, here you are in my mind, I was living the fairy tale. You know, I held out for the guy I wanted and I found him and life was great. I mean, and, and here I am, there I was a year later getting injections in the butt from him. And I'm like, this is not beautiful. This is not sexy. This is you know, I wanted to give him that. I'm like, I want him to be able to have that pregnant wife and I couldn't give it to him. And it was absolutely devastating. And even seeing the results on the pregnancy test, you know, seeing the disappointment in his eyes was horrible. And it's hard not to blame yourself and feel like it's your fault. You know, um, you had said you were trying to blame other things. I just couldn't stop blaming myself. And I think that was a big part of you know, my second doctor is Dr. Scott at RMA, and we had a first um, sitting with him. And I kept asking him, like, should I do acupuncture? Should I have less gluten? Should I, all this stuff. 
And he grabbed my hand, my wrist very tightly and said, Brett, this is not your fault. Mm. I get you me about it. Cause I think it was the first time that I said, I realized like how much guilt I was holding on my shoulders. You know, you don't realize it when you're in it cause you're in fight mode and trying to get it, you know, and you realize, wow, I've been blaming myself all this time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's so detrimental to, again, your spirit, your soul, and then the soul or the spirit that your husband married, he's seeing somebody completely different and that soul is in pain. And if you don't heal that pain, then you even rise up, like even that you have this baby. And this is what I noticed for, for us after I adopted or we had went through our Russian adoption, I came home, I was still in pain, even though I had what I had and I got what I wanted. And I was so like, of course, elated being a mom, but I didn't heal my soul. And that's what I really love, you know, in the story of all stories, we all have to heal because when you say it wasn't my fault and I need to nurture my girl because my girl needs to understand inside, she's still a beautiful being and mm -hmm. she is worthy and she can accomplish a lot. So whether it happens or doesn't happen, it doesn't define you. It doesn't define who or how amazing you are, but you have to heal backwards. And all those months and years that it didn't happen, she just got depleted of her beautiful spirit. And I think into, then when you get to that place of being a mom, now more than ever, you need to heal you because <laughs> let me tell you something about motherhood. They don't rise, let, up level you. <laughs> Sure. This should be down. This peanut butter and jelly stinks. Like, <laughs> okay. Once I think your IVF process is just God's way of preparing you for the misery of being a mother. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all funny and all good, but when you're going through it, it's so raw and so painful. And I so appreciate you writing this book and sharing your story because. I know you are one of those women who do make it look so easy on the outside, so naturally beautiful, so perfect, always wore the right clothes, drove the right car, just made that look like you had it all going on, Brett. And I think that I love you more than I did love you before, and I loved you tons. And I think that it makes my heart feel so open to see that in spite of looking like you have it all, and even when you had it all to the point that you felt like you didn't have it, you are still healing and rising up to become the woman that you're here to be. And because you are someone who people look up to, I think more you than ever, because people are gonna listen and they're gonna be felt heard and held and seen and I think that's going to help our world heal a little bit more than it did yesterday. So thank you for being on the Magnificent Mamas Thrive Show and sharing your book. Hold it up again because I love the cover. <laughs> it's so pretty. And we're going to make sure that we put the links to that and how they can get the book and even where to find you because I'm sure you opening up is going to help people open up to get real with themselves too. Well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate being here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a good thing when, when women band together, it's, you know, it's, it's, I remember when I was writing this, I had several arguments with my husband because I said, if we're not real and vulnerable, it's not going to be authentic. You know, you can't pretend to be someone that people want you to be. You have to be real or it's just not even worth it. So whatever you're going through in life, you know, be real because there are people out there hurting. Where, why ever you're hurting, whatever it is, there are people out there feeling the same way and will feel it will be better for them to hear what you have to say at your vulnerable moments than you're not. So. Yeah. And especially now when the world is all in pain, we need to say, it's okay for us to be in pain wherever your pain is and just validate that. 
understand it. So from there, you can move from that space and make it better and heal. So when you heal, everyone else can give, gives them permission to heal themselves. Okay. So tell me where we can find you. Where do you hang out? Where do I hang out? Do you um, have websites? Do you, are yeah. you on social? Are you on uh, Instagram? Like I haven't been out of my house. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a new mama. What are you talking my about? Brain, my mama brain. I was like, oh, where? I haven't gotten dressed up since this morning. Like, you don't know what's on. I've got slippers on. <laughs> That's perfect. Love it. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I have a website, brett-russo.com. And that's where my, all the updates on the books will be. Um, and, you know, please share with me your story. Um, if you can't afford the books, please let me know and I'll send you an electronic copy. Um, and um, just want to hear your story. And if you, I could be there for you in more ways than just the book, please let me know. And that's awesome. that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brett. I know you're going to be out there changing lives. So thanks so much for being here. See you soon.